Hello, welcome everybody to a very special installment of Maker's Place Whale. I'm here today flanked by two incredible creative forces of our time, renowned artist and creator of Angelarium, Peter Moorbacher, and Tom hey. Morello, social activist and Grammy Award winning guitarist of Rage Against the Machine, Audio Slave, Prophets of Rage, and more. I'm super excited to hear all about your collaboration called Order of Chaos which is D&D inspired by Tom's own adventures. So I'm really excited to hear all about it. Thank you for being with us today. Hey, thanks very much for having us. How's it going? Of course. Um, so I'm sure there's very few people who are not familiar with your work, but um, for both of you, could you tell us a little bit about your creative background for anyone who's not aware? Go ahead, Peter. <laughs> um, I worked in the game industry for a, a while. I did a bunch of magic cards and stuff. And then um, at some point I realized that, um, you know, kind of how everyone's realizing that crypto enables creative people to just make their art, bring it out to the world. Um, I realized that that was happening even before crypto. And I jumped out there and I created my own independent brand called Angelarium. And I've been uh, building that and surviving off my fan base for the past eight years. And so I'm um, a little bit of a folk hero, uh, but, it, you know, uh, it's a it's a it's a pleasure to be a part of this uh, bigger project, and um, oh, we're bouncing all over the place here. <laughs> yeah, uh, <Sounds> fantastic. <laughs> you know, I've been you know out here on the internet making art, posting art, and then um, selling it straight to people out on the web without galleries or curators or anything like that for a long, long time. And uh, it's been good. And I've been advocating for other creative people to jump in the same space, doing some teaching in that front too. Yeah, yeah. And I know uh, you've been in the NFT space for yeah. a while. Oh yeah, and then you know I got on Make I'm Maker's Place OG. Uh, they called me up back in 2018. Um, oh, I, wow. I launched a, a series of 12 pieces as a collection on there. Um, you know, back in 2018, I think they all have mint numbers and like three digits. So it's like some of the first oh, wow. you know few hundred pieces up on the site. Um, and you know, we've just stayed in touch this whole time. That's awesome. And, and I started playing guitar when I was 17 years old, <laughs> <laughs> you know, through, through, through bands, some of the bands you mentioned, Rage Against the Machine, Audio Slave, Prophets of Rage. Like I've been over the course of the last three decades, you know, a uh, working musician and practicing activist. Uh, but one of the, the things that I, that I began doing as a, uh, as a kid and then took about, uh, 30 years off while playing rock and roll was playing Dungeons and Dragons. And I always loved sort of the artwork of the books and the, the you know, from the, from the lore of kind of Lord of the Rings stuff. I worked, my first job was working in a Renaissance fair. Like I, I didn't want kind of that world of Lord of the Rings to end. And so d playing Dungeons and Dragons and immersing myself in that was, was huge. I loved the, you know, I you, was a, a aspiring artist myself and I kind of draw the characters and write these sort of these back these backstories and whatnot then you know a, a lifetime of rock and roll incurred but it was uh it was about you know maybe three years ago Joe Manganiello the actor uh, who runs a sort of a Hollywood Dungeons and Dragons game invited me back and and they play with the same um enthusiasm and, and innocence that I played with when I was 16 or 17 years old, except like on a budget. And, you know, with the, you know, it's like, you know, it's the creator of Game of Thrones and it's, you know, it's the creator of Chernobyl. Like where these people have like these kind of like really great creative minds creating these stories, which is just for like purely just for fun. So during the, during like, um, you know, when, when lockdown happened, I was frankly losing my fucking mind and, and the Dungeons and Dragons games ramped up to about four, about four a week. And I wanted to find a way to sort of like sort of mer like to get that world to share that world in a way. Um, and I discovered Peter's art and Peter is just a trim as you know if you're watching is, is just a tremendous artist and was able to bring like a lifetime of my characters that I played from when I was a youth to the ones that I play, the ones that I play now to life is this order of Karas uh, sort of fantasy hero warrior warrior group. And and then I um you know I the thing that I the, the, the twist is that I created original music for all of the, for, for each of the pieces, which was a, a, a ball too. So in a way to sort of maintain sanity, you know, as a, <laughs> now a non-touring musician uh, and sort of indulge in my, you know, sort of Dungeons and Dragons world and that sort of fantasy art is how we, how we came together to do this collaboration. That's awesome. I was curious, um, what is your connection to Peter's art? Like, how did you find it? And um, Peter, what's your connection to Tom's music? 
Yeah, well, I would say that I was when I was looking for you know the right artist to bring these characters to life, and and you know there's a you know there's, a, there's people in the world of like comics and this that and the other, but as I, the when I discovered his art, like I, to me it was it it was obvious that like he just has such a there's a there's a I don't know sort of a a, a new a beauty and a nuance that that is in Peter's art that felt mm -hmm. both sort of there was a fantastical element, a futuristic element, and yet it was sort of grounded in the kind of cool, kick-ass world of, I, of Dungeons and Dragons that I have in my mind. Um, and so, anyway, he was yeah. he was kind enough to uh, to uh, to collaborate on this with me. Yeah, just sharing some of his work here. And Peter, what about you? Um, so you've well, so Tom, you approached Peter for this project. Yeah, That's yeah, it. yeah, and um, you know, and was just I just fell in love with his work and and I, well, I'll tell you a, a very a very important sort of uh, uh, crossroads in our you know sort of creative creative dialogue was I had you know different representations of these characters over the course of the last couple couple of years um, and and it was when he said so do you want me to I'm paraphrasing but like do you want me to draw them just like this I said no I want you to like do you and he seemed yeah. uh, uh, excited about that as as was I I wanted him to like to sort of take these characters and apply you know his his creative genius to them. Yeah, I mean, yeah, back in the day, I, I I moved away from taking jobs where people just told me what to draw and then you yeah. know tried to do it exactly like how they told me to. It's the reason I don't have any official art in any of the D and D manuals. You know, I was working yeah. with them during time when they were working on those, and I was just like, you know, I've I've it's it's important to me to to you know be involved in the process, and so like I was excited to work on this because it felt like it was actually a collaboration where we were making something together. And, you know, I thought it was funny too, cause like, um, it, you know, I knew about the D and D game that you were in because you were playing with a guy I used to work with, Who's uh, that? Ryan Vernier. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like not a big, not, not a famous Hollywood guy. I think is, is it like, um, he knew them through, through a more circuitous route. Um, and then I was like, I know, I know that game. Ryan's in that game. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm like, that is a small world. Cause it's like, I, I had no idea that that sort of weird roundabout, you know, friend of a friend connection would end up leading to us like working on a project and dropping this thing today. Yeah, that's crazy. That's so cool. And yeah, I was curious, Tom, because I heard you mention that um, you used to draw your characters yourself. And I was wondering if you had sent any sketches to Peter or if it was just no, totally. No, I, no I, I got off that. I got other, there was, like I said, over the course of the last couple of years, I've like the different games have commissioned various like comic book artists to sort of do draw our party this that and so there were some representations and but you know like 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 I, I took that game very seriously as a youth and I take it very very seriously now and so like I was like no the lock has to be you know this particular shade there's there's sort of unique because because the 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 five characters uh in the order of Keras they're they're real characters from real games that I've lived with for years you know sometimes long ago sometimes more recently and then they have like sort of living breathing gaming histories over the course of years and like adventures that are in that fantasy world at least are very very real they're not like oh we made up a nice looking minotaur for this thing like that guy's got that guy and i have history <laughs> man i got so nervous knowing i knew that going into it it made me really nervous because i know some people they then when they try to commission artwork for their D, &D characters it's like impossible impossible it's, it's yeah. impossible and it's just like i'm like gambling i'm like tom's a creative guy i bet you he knows where to you know uh to be firm on the direction yes. and where to like leave yeah. leave more room and i'm just yeah. like crossing my fingers i'm like yeah I, I bet tom's gonna be all right and it turned out great you know you, you uh you were very specific about some things and i was happy to oblige on those like i was just i just want to make sure that this thing was going to turn out in a way that you were proud of because like you know, it, it's it, the, the relationships to these characters get so powerful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, I'm a newcomer sort of stepping into this space where yeah. you've had all this time with it already. I'm like, yeah, yeah I, I got to I got to work hard to honor the. the I think I think I think I think you hit it. You hit it out of the park. And one of the things that, you know, as a as a as a recovering comic book collector, too. I mean, I always liked when when sort of different artists would tackle my favorite comic book characters. So there's a you know, there's a multiplicity of ways that that they can go. But but like you've done the definitive versions of these and it's really it's really awesome. So appreciate well, that's sweet. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I yeah. It, it, it was really, it was really fortunate that this, this came together the way it did. I, um, I almost never worked for anybody 
Um, this is a this is a rare collaboration, and it's a it's a rare uh, instance over the past eight years where I've worked on anything other than my own project. So mm -hmm. it's a little bit of a stepping out into um, fresh territory for me. Well, I think it came out really well, and I was curious, um, what was the like technical process like, um, and also did the music come before the um, illustrations or vice versa? Well, Peter can speak to the, te the, I mean, the technical process was me sort of sending some sketches and whatnot and sort of d descriptions, but the music came afterwards. Like I wanted to see, especially because there's, you know, there's a, that kind of uh, animation to them as well. And I kind of wanted to have some feel for that to, to hint at, hint at direction. But again, it was just, it was really a, you know, like a, a labor, a labor, this, this whole project is really like a labor of love. Like the, you know, from the D and D stuff to sort of seeing these characters that you love kind of manifest, ma manifesting themselves to like writing some, whether it's spooky jams or, or big rock and roll riffs that, that accompany the characters. Uh, it was just a, a, a really great project for me all the way around. Yeah. I'm going to um, put, turn the sound on on this. So uh, just lower your headphones and my like blow your ears out, but <laughs> we'll, we'll check it out. Cause it doesn't let you, adjust the volume on Maker's Place. So here we go. <laughs> that's, sick. <laughs> that's just one. That's, uh, that's just, Golden Field. That's Golden Field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is uh, an edition of 25, right? Yeah, that's just that guy. Yeah. Do you want to talk about the lore behind? Um, sure. You, you, if you want, you, if you want to put them up one at a time, I'll be happy to tell you. Yeah. Hold on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, this is uh, okay. So yeah, you can go to the, the top one. You can go to the top one there. Uh, you go to Black Feather. If you could. Yeah. Click on that one. Okay. So the. Uh, I guess let's hear the music click. <laughs> All right, so the so uh, the the black feather is like a Joan of Arc like figure, a fallen Azamar. It's basically sort of like a, a fallen angel, this sort of this teenage uh, sorceress uh, who is also a conquest paladin. So it's someone who has sort of one foot in the uh, has one foot in the light and one foot in the dark, and maybe leaning a little heavier to the dark side. Who may not entirely be sort of uh, uh, stable, but has such a powerful and commanding charisma and aura of fear about her that she sort of forged this kind of French foreign legion like of 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 orphans and and street urchins and forged them into an army. And then the Order of Keros are the are her like top lieutenants and that we've made out of the, the different characters that I've played through the years. So that's the Black Feather, their leader. You go to Kamathi Storm Hollow, if you would. Oh, this was, I, I want to say really quick, oh, this yeah, was the one that, that took the most revisions to get right, but it's also the one I'm most proud of. Yeah. of it. And I, I hit an Easter egg in here. Sorry. Apologies. There is a, there is an Ethereum symbol on the on the sword i never i never hide ethereum mm -hmm. stuff around like people do this all the time in the nft space i never do that on anything yeah. i was like this one this one it i'm going to put a little a little tiny knot in there just a tiny little just a little yeah, a little tiny the, little taste that's really tasteful tasteful. the way yeah. you did it yeah <laughs> um and uh, General Kamathi Stormhawk. Yeah, yeah. So one of the one of the things I did with this, and I'm not sure where, sort of in all of it. My blast your ears. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, rock it. That uh, auto play. Then, okay. All right. Let's do it. Uh, if the internet will go to space, please hold for technical difficulties. Yeah. <laughs> The internet is keeping us from being great. All right. Well, let, well right. Let, I'll I'll try to give a I'll try to give a great description while the internet decides what's what what it wants to do there. <laughs> Maybe I, have, I thought I had it. So, here we go. So this there yeah. you go. That's it. Yeah. So that's uh that's uh this is the character that sort of brought me back into Dungeon Dra and Dragons in the Joe Manganiello game, and that uh you know I I sort of have played him as like the the, the grandson of a character that I played you know long ago when I when 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 I was a kid, and uh you know he's a a mountain dwarf champion fighter who's like a folk hero in the small he's sort of sort of like a John Henry of the mines who then is is saves his local community from from uh, 
from disaster and then is sent out on a mission to investigate rumors of like a dragon cult that's rising. And he's very confident that his his physical prowess will uh, will will save the day like it always has. And he's completely wrong. Uh, and so he sort of turns to religion to become a forge cleric and sort of going to like the religion of the of the mountain dwarves in order to you know make weapons out of out of dragon scale and armor and that's his faithful steed brago uh the 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 polar bear who he's a uh, that's his mount and together they've had countless adventures and uh he eventually after the war of dragons returns to to storm hollow his home but he has like that kind of veteran ptsd where he can no longer settle in so he seeks out seeking violence and adventure again and eventually finds himself in the thrall of the black feather and becomes the general of her troops of the order of Keros. That's so cool too that you've been playing for so long that you're playing the grandson. The grandchild, oh, yeah, yeah, the grandson, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, one thing I did in all the description, I'm not sure exactly where you where you find on the site, but you know, I kind of wrote the there's pretty extensive uh, bios of these characters as well as their yeah. Dungeons and Dragons stats. You know, like uh, the real stats from the characters in, in the game. Yeah, I was reading them myself, and the lore is so cool. And uh, everybody can I'm sharing the link in stream text, but definitely take the time to read it. It's super cool. Um, so, so if you Peter, you want any any sort of th thoughts on the, the that particular drawing? Oh, I knew right away this was one that you had huge feelings about. I knew that you had a lot of history with this guy. It was one of those ones where I was like, it, you know, that there was you you had a very very specific feeling about him that you wanted. You were very specific about certain uh, physical details and stuff, and I was like, Tom has a ton of history with this. Yeah. And I feel like this is a this is a character I think that's impossible to illustrate correctly. Oh, because well. because it's like it's something that you have such a deep relationship with. I don't know if it could be fully externalized. I think that the real yeah. Kamathi is gonna be forever a part of of you rather than something that can be totally shared. Yeah. Well, I gotta say, dude, that's a that you that's a badass drawing you did of General Kamathi Stormhall right there. So I appreciate that. <laughs> well, thank it's you. So dope. I mean um, Peter, your illustrations are so um, just deep and the lighting and detail and they're just like the story that Tom's telling, I think that it really comes out in the work. Um, and I know you were maybe um, not sure if you could um, get what was in his mind, but and I can't possibly know that because I'm not in Tom's mind. But I mean, these are just stunning. And I, I feel like they are telling the story that's in the descriptions. And the music is adding to it too. Like they all just, they make sense together too. Like hearing the music with the character, um, like the music that goes with the black feather goes with her and sounds like, you know, she's a bit in the dark, but also in the light. Like it really looks like that and sounds like that. I think you guys did an amazing job. Um, so, okay, that's the third. And we have uh, Pastor Vindasin. Okay, it's gonna blast our ears off. Yes. No. No internet. Right. Internet is not being cool right now, but the piece internet still looks amazing. Internet is doing us a disservice, but uh, so that one, mm -hmm. you know, briefly, Pastor Vindison is like a. Uh, 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 a smuggler and sort of a, a Robin Hood like uh, you know sort of hero along the mirror of dead men, um, who then finds himself you know is eventually the law catches up with him, spends about a decade in jail where he sort of learns the the, the ways of uh, the way of mercy. It's like a monk a monk's order. So he um, you know he becomes someone who is always sort of standing up for he and healing the poor uh, and and those the most wretched parts of society, um, but then also leads this kind of jailbreak this prison break and becomes this kind of like robin hood like scourge across the land where rumor of his deeds reach the black feather and she actually recruits him and uh, makes him an offer that he can't refuse though he alone is not subject to her thrall and so one of the reasons she respects him and makes him his uh makes him her top lieutenant and chief advisor this is so cool. You know, I've honestly never pl gotten a chance to play D and D. I've always wanted to, but this campaign sounds super cool. <laughs> like yeah, I want to play. Yeah. Well, they're all like from different campaigns. Like I, they're, it's basically sort of an Avengers assemble from like different games that I've played in, oh, in different nice. places, and then and then the 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 the, the commonality, uh, the the tethers that keep them together is something that is created specifically for this collection. Let's we'll see. That's super cool. Um. Peter, what is it? I, I'm just curious. You know, there's there's so many details in these stories, and like how how is it like for you to um, 
translate these into a single image, um, you know, what is that process for you? How do you distill these stories? Uh, I've got a bit of an alchemy like solution to this whole thing. Um, my, my main goal is to try to make sure that like the emotional, uh, reality of the character is like, um, is there. So like, I'm trying to pick up on what the themes with the vibe of like the personality is for these characters. And I'm trying to, to keep that in mind and just let myself draw rather than from a logical place, but just sort of, um, be open to what's happening on the page as I start to draw, keeping in mind those themes. And then I just hope that the muse ends up doing the thing. And like, I, I, I will, I will go through and I'll edit and I'll nudge it along the way, but I'm really just, um, I'm trying to put that intention in mentally. And then I'm finding out what that ends up looking like, um, just as a matter of discovery. And, mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes I've got ideas on where it's going to go. This one was like, I, I thought it was almost too easy. I was like, Oh, I, I feel like I totally get like what is going to make sense for this. And I was again, crossing my fingers. I'm like, Oh, come on. I hope that this is, uh, in line with what Tom's hoping for out of this. Cause it was just like, you know, when, when you hold that stuff in your mind, then there's a part of you that understands it, that doesn't totally get verbalized. And I've, I've, grown to be able to trust the part of me that taps into that inner voice over the years. It's been my, you know, one of the primary skills that I've developed as an artist over the past like couple decades. And um, it always feels a little risky, but it always ends up working out. So I keep doing it. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, it's always feels a little mysterious and magical every time it does. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was thinking that your uh, Angelarium co collection, um, just the lore behind that, like that must have prepared you for this project in some ways. Um, I think that, yeah, this is very much like uh, Angelarium taught me about mythology, about the ways mm -hmm. that we sort of build a pantheon to describe, you know, our own inner worlds. And a cast of D&D characters is as much a sort of divine pantheon as mm. you know a group of angels like any kind of um cast of diverse characters ends up taking on the different sort of archetypes that we uh inhabit personally and so it's like each of these characters is a different i i, I think of them as a different aspect of tom and like a mm. different type of archetype that you know he's inhabited at different times and i think that it's not just him though it's like we all embody a lot of these same archetypes yeah. as this shared experience. And so when we, when we think about, you know, our own relationship to themes and our own relationship to these personas in an authentic way and create from that space, other people are going to get it. And, um, yeah. you know, that, that commonality, I think that's something that anyone who's worked in the creative world has, has gotten to see the sort of magic of that work out before. And it, it always feels like you're, you're again, like a, operating a little bit on faith and going out a little bit, um, taking a little bit of a risk by doing it. But I feel like that's the only way that you can end up making something authentic. That's very true. I, I feel like uh, overthinking is definitely the mind killer for creativity or the, it's just the vibe killer for creativity. And um, I really uh, admire that approach that you just allow your intuition to, and allow your hand to just do something instead of, um, overthinking and trying to um, impress Tom or, or get it exactly how you think Tom might have thought it would be. Um, it's more about tapping oh, into the oh, feeling. Yeah. The character. yeah. If I was just trying to figure out what he likes and trying to create it as an expectation of what he <laughs> thought he was going to enjoy, it would, <laughs> it would come out bad. Like yeah. whenever you're, whenever you're trying to create something for what you think somebody else wants, that always comes out bad. Yeah. It's bad. Yeah. I mean, oh, one of the, one of the an interesting analogy in this is to like um, a collaborative songwriting process. I notice that there's like a there's a there's a chemistry to it, which is which is real, and where you know, which, sorry, okay, my mom calling me, uh, and is uh, you know is the is the genesis of that is like okay, here's some D and D characters that sort of exist in my mind and have existed in in the in these games as sort of my contribution to the process, but then I they ended up being something that was greater than I imagined them being because of the 
chemistry. Like you, are, you apply your genius to this idea that's from over here and it creates something that neither of us would have created on our own. You know what I'm saying? Like, and that's, that's very much like the songwriting process. Why, you know, writing with others can create something that goes beyond, you know, the individual. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, that's a really, yeah, that is a perfect analogy for this kind of collaboration too. And I feel like the chemistry was awesome between the two of you on this. And we have two more uh, pieces that I, I'm really curious about the rest of the lore. Cause as you're talking about it, I'm like really drawn in. I like want to know everything. Um, and yeah, and then we can talk about the drop itself too. Um, hold on, we got, did we talk about Goldenfield already? No, no, no we didn't do that. Goldenfield and Crick are the best two. Okay. Okay. My <laughs> well, the internet does not work. The internet, like, the internet's got about like four seconds hard. for us. And then, <laughs> it just rocks too hard. It can't handle it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, this one, this is, this is, uh, uh, this is Goldenfield, the Minotaur Berserker uh, Barbarian. Uh, and his and his story is he was a like a, a mercenary veteran, uh, a mercenary uh, like working on a working on a ship, the Blood Axe Mercenary Company. Um, the ship gets like locked in ice, and it becomes a cannibal barge where he emerges as the only as the only survivor, sort of racked with guilt at how he had to survive. He wanders through Icewind Dales, which is the the northernmost part of Faroon, the sort of D &D, main D and D world there, um, just like in pit fights and like just in nothing but trouble, is drunk and in trouble and just using his brawn to make a few dollars to buy the next booze, uh, finds himself with some adventurers, finally gets a little bit of self-respect, is made sort of a deputy due to his brawn in a couple of these communities, but his demons always find him and always haunt him. He makes his way south where he confronts, he runs into sort of like a, a, a an attachment of the Order of Karas where he murders a number of the black feathers sort of foot soldiers and is cornered by the rest and he's about to be slain uh when the black feather herself approaches him and for the first time he experiences like sort of love and mercy uh she kisses his cheek puts his hand on her horn and perhaps casts some sort of spell on him to make them fall in love he now is her uh uh number one acolyte and madly in love with her in her personal bodyguard and the strongest person in the within 10,000 miles. So he's her henchman slash, well, not lover. He's, it's no, a, no, it's not lover. No, no. He, wouldn't, he wouldn't dare to dream. He wouldn't dare to dream. <laughs> I love this. Um, Peter, do you have anything to say about this one? Um, you know, I, I heard in the backstory that he had this really violent past, but I saw this character as uh, somebody who's, uh, I'm getting a lot of echo. Is it from... Do you, Tom? No, no, let me turn off my mic. Is it me? Hold on, let me, let me put on some headphones. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I just saw him as a, a character who, you know, was balancing, you know, a violent past with like a reformed present. And so I wanted to show him in sort of a, a peaceful moment where he was like peaceful and centered, um, but with this sort of, sort of undercurrent. Current. I'm still getting a lot of echo. That oh, can't man. be me now, right? Yeah, right. I don't know. <laughs> I'm getting that echo as well. Are you getting the echo too? Yeah. It's now Heather. I'm not. It's Heather. Heather. It's me. Oh my god. <laughs> I know. Hold on. Oh my god. No. Uh, I might have to use my computer mic. Let's see if that helps. Yeah. But but I do think Peter really really captured the yeah. essence. essence. What? Now the as the echo is kind of crazy right now. It's hard. <laughs> check one, two. Check one, two. That seems check. better. Check, check. That seems Got that's it. better. That's it. That All seems right. better. I was going to say so that I think, I think that Peter captured the essence because it is someone who is always just sort of like been off the rails and kind of unbound to anything and now has a real sense of purpose. And, you know, it's, it's, just, it's this devotion. And now he's able to sort of marshal all of his sort of physical, uh, uh, powers uh for one purpose and one purpose only and that is to to protect and to do the will of the black feather it's fucking sick um okay and then we've got this is the um oh no we've edition. got we, we we missed one we missed one we missed we crick. yeah we missed one my bad yep 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 quick 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 here we go yeah all right it might blast again <laughs> <laughs> Prepare yourselves. 
the internet. Oh. Internet just it's, doesn't want to let me. It's not. Even, it's not even going to blast us this time. No. All right. You're gonna so you have, just put up. You, you have to. You have to trust me. The music is a jam on this one. Is a big no, ass rock and roll riff it on is. this one. This I just want big, it to load. Hope, hopefully, people when they go, go to the actual site will be able to see it. If anyone yeah. you want to just put, put up the picture. So this is Crick Ever. Yeah, this is Crick Evervenge, and uh, he's of the Dullahan race, which is like the headless race. It's like a like the headless horseman kind of kind of vibe, and uh, uh, which is a which is a in in my imagination is a race, sort of a Bedouin like race, and kind of like a the the Shar Desolation, which is kind of a very sort of deserty place. Um, one fateful night when he's a youth, an Oni, which is sort of like an evil genie person comes in a storm kidnaps his sister the storm takes him up his broken body is sort of found far from he he finds himself far from anywhere he's ever known um he's his moans are heard by a, a night hag who then uses him for a, mul for a multiplicity of dark purposes through the years um sort of warping him and he, he escapes um and finds his way he's heard of the order of Karas and um wants to impress the black feather which he does by slaying her top lieutenant and fashioning his spine into a whip which then he uses as as a as a weapon which you can see in that uh, picture there and he becomes like her her acolyte you know he's like her her understudy in a way that she sees the same kind of like darkness in him that she sees in her own kind of tortured soul and um that's, and and so she he he asks for him he he wants to take a leave of absence to go look for his sister and she says you may and she gives him this magical lock and she says but the price for leaving the order for this time is uh she needs the drop of five hundred the blood of five hundred souls that you have slain and so each drop mm -hmm. goes in the lock she he opens it closes it and the number goes up by one when he reaches five hundred then he's fulfilled his mission. Um. That's awesome. I love this one, Peter. This is just gorgeous. Even I thought this one was going to be super disturbing. easy. Because, <laughs> like, I have a reputation for drawing, like, faceless and headless characters. Yeah. <laughs> and so I was like, this one's going to be a slam dunk. And it was so hard. Like, it, whenever there is, uh, whenever I think that a piece is going to be really easy, it always smashes me in the face. Yeah. Um, it, it's always the opposite of what my expectation is. And I say that to everybody and I've said that to myself and I was just like, no, 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 this one's, this one's going to be, a, this one's going to be the easy one. And I must've spent so much time on this. Yeah. Just like slaving over it, making sure that everything about it was perfect um, before, you know, handing it off and calling it done. Yeah. Well, it really gets the vibe. I mean, this, this character is a conquest paladin, which is basically sort of a, like a knight, who uses fear like it's not it's more about sort of like fear and domination than it is about sort of good deeds and also a hexblade warlock and i think you really kind of get like the warlock vibe in this one as well the sort of the dark magical thing so those are the members yeah, of the order right. of Keras right there and this one trust me has a badass riff <laughs> i know i'm gonna try to make it work yeah someone in in our stream text was like that riff was really rage like <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm looking. Yeah. I'm looking through the oh, drop. Is this stopping. is this right it's that the, whoever wins the auction for the one of one is going to get a Tom Morello signed Stratocaster? Yeah, yes. I was going to yeah, ask whoever, about that. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So so whoever gets the one of one, I, I have a signature guitar uh, with Fender. It's a Soul Power guitar. It's the guitar that I used in throughout the Audio Slave years, and I I m made a sig. I'd never done like a. Uh, guitar endorsement before because I don't really like it when guitar players did endorsements because like when I was a kid my favorite guitar players would like endorse a different brand of guitar on every record I'm like I want the guitar that you played on like the good record yes, that I liked yeah. you know and this is that I made a guitar that's identical to the Strato the, the Soul Power guitar I use in Audio Slave and so it's a signed Soul Power guitar oh, okay. that the, the person who gets the the one of one gets that guitar yeah. as well. I was curious if it was like the actual guitar that you. They do not get the I actual like, guitar. I, get, I was I like, get, I, know, I wouldn't be able to let that go. I yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, that one's sitting right over there, but it's got, it has all the, all the properties. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Whoever gets that is extremely lucky. Um, I just, they also I just get a JPEG up. from me. Which is they, they are also extremely lucky to get. Which is super lucky. Yes. Dub, dub, that's called yeah. double lucky. Yeah, double yeah. Luck, yeah. Lucky. This art is amazing. And, um, I also wanted to say, Peter, uh, there was a question for you. Um, uh, what programs were you using to create these? And um, how long did it take you to um, get these out? These look like they took 14 hours each to me. 
uh, I use Photoshop and um, there's a lot of art in the NFT space that I really love that is all done through like uh, stock models and, you know, uh, algorithm generation and stuff like that. My, I'm not so lucky. <laughs> I, my family had to go on vacation without me so I could stay home and slowly scrape these no. together over the course of thousands of little brush strokes. Uh, yeah. And so I basically construct them like an oil painting, but in Photoshop, just um, each mark made by hand one at a time on a tablet. And uh, it's a really painstaking way to make art, but um, there's something about the, the process. I, you know, I, there's ways of faking some stuff, but there are something about mm -hmm. the, the authentic quality of hand assembling everything and just really um, every little variation in the edges and uh, the patterns of light and dark that pass along a figure is all stuff that I've assembled on purpose. Um, everything is in there specifically because I put it in there. Um, it's a super intentional way of making mm -hmm. a, a piece of art. And I think that's the reason I'm drawn to it. Uh, but it, it is slow. <laughs> it is yeah, very slow. I mean, it, it looks incredible. I mean, your lighting technique is like, it's like Rembrandt, just um, so realistic. And I think that, you know, painting in Photoshop is, for me, that's definitely more fun than like 3D rendering and stuff like that. Like, cause then that's the closest thing you can get digitally to actually painting is actually doing each stroke one by one but i know in photoshop that can be a lot on the file itself too it just like takes forever to save and like yeah yeah <laughs> and it, it's like um you know i like a lot of different things you know and i respect the there's a, a massive amount of diversity in the nft space which is one of my favorite things about it um and so i'm just hoping that you know there's people who really appreciate like uh this style of art the same way I do. Cause I mean, I've got like oil paints and stuff up around my, my studio. Uh, this is a craft that I've uh, been in love with for many, many years. And so um, I can't imagine making art any other way, even though it is deeply onerous to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and it, it would be, it, it's always been an interesting challenge for me because like I put all of this love and work into it and the end result is a, is a file. It's always a digital file. Um, mm -hmm. and the world has not respected that for a very, very long time up until about this year where all, all of a sudden yeah. it, it, it was like not good enough, not good enough. And I, I did it anyway, cause this is my love. And, um, then this year it was good enough and I'm very happy about that. <laughs> yeah, me too. There've been a lot of un unsung visual artists for many years that now I think the NFT world has, um, created. A whole new future for artists that they can um you know make a living and that was actually going to be one of my questions for you like um uh, how do you feel about this this new space um basically allowing artists to make a living and own their art and they've i feel like artists have taken their power back um because yeah of this whole movement there's there's a, i I've, i think about this a lot and i you know there's um there's two sides to it that I that I, I think really um, I have, I'm really passionate about. Number one is there's this great reset. I, I've been I've been popping into clubhouse rooms and hearing classical people who are part of the fine art market complain over and over and over again that there aren't any critics inside the uh, the NFT space. There's nobody who's telling you what's oh, no, good and no, bad are the NFT space. <laughs> and I'm just like I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm on Twitter all the time. There's all of these big name people. Whose, mm -hmm. whose followings have exploded, you know, by tens of thousands over the course of uh, this year because they have strong voices and they have meaningful opinions and people have looked to them as, as tastemakers. And, you know, but the classical art world is just afraid that the wrong kind of artists are going to start succeeding. Yeah. And I love it. I mean, I've always been so on the wrong. side of the wrong kind of artists succeeding. And so, um, you know, it, I there's people who I think should be getting, I'm not talking about myself, there's there's people who I think should be getting more recognition in this be. space that I'm hoping that they're they're going to get discovered and and there there are people are going to fall in love with their art but there are so many people I know that never would have gotten a second glance from serious yeah. art collectors and certainly all the that includes every digital artist and mm -hmm. now it's there's this brand new space where um, we're able to define our own future 
and we are leaving a bunch of dinosaurs out on the on the front stoop you know complaining about maybe it's not that good to be in that space and maybe if they got some people with real taste in there then it'd be really good and i'm just like it's hilarious watching them gripe about it um the other thing that I love about this space, the real, I think what the real technological innovation here is actually the royalty model. Um, yes. The, the completely automated royalty model. Uh, uh, people ask a lot, what is, what about NFTs is actually new? Haven't we been selling stuff online for a long time? And yeah. they're kind of right in that sense, but the automated royalties is a uh, completely uh, revolutionary technology. Mm -hmm. Um uh, that that has the ability to to reframe the market in ways that I don't think people fully appreciate yet because they haven't gotten to see it last long enough. Right. And I think some of the top speakers in this space have been beating this drum and people haven't been hearing them clearly enough. This is no. this is a killer feature. And, you know, Tom, I'm sure you've seen stuff in the music industry where you sure would have liked to see people who had companies make a lot of money off of their of back course. should have gone to the artist of course and it's, it's not some le even if there's a legal contract yeah. in place how do you even audit whether or not the of money all went to the right space always all i mean it's a it's a fixture yeah. that yeah. every five mm -hmm. years someone's stolen a tremendous amount of money <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah get the suit get the suits out of the room replace mm -hmm. them with a piece of code that's yeah. that's the yeah. thing that i think is so special about this space because then when artists are minting their work into this space they get to define those terms and no one can argue with them and no one can cheat yep. them out of it. If they're, if those NFTs are going to get traded, then the people are going to get their payment back. And the, that situation is only getting better the longer the technology matures. I'd love it. Yeah, I love it too. And I think it's, um, it's a boon for the music, music industry and any other type of collaborative art, because then everybody involved will have this unbreakable uh, means of receiving the, royalties that are rightfully theirs and that can mm -hmm. even go to their descendants when they die and they pass their wallet on to them like it's nothing like anything in the traditional world and i also think that um the smart contract having the royalties built in it also creates creates a relationship with collectors and artists that wasn't there before like now they have this kind of symbiotic relationship that when the collector wins on a sale the artist wins and if the collector supports the artist that behooves the collector for their resale and it helps the artist. And it's just this awesome feedback loop that isn't there in um, traditional art. So yeah, as, as someone who has been friends with a lot of visual artists for years, so starving visual artists, you know, yes. you know, who, who do tremendous work, who then some, someone five, people down the line makes millions of dollars from it and they're you know they're still you know in a, in a silver lake loft trying to to figure it out it's like yeah it's it's you know it's and, and you've got some the... some assholes telling them oh you know you should be grateful you know now that you've done made all this money for this guy maybe someone will hire yes. you for something to pay yeah, you a exactly. one-off fee yeah. and that's, right. That's, that's right that's right that's right it's yeah. been like that for a long time yeah yeah, yeah. and yeah. that's this uh is a completely different model which is which is definitely much more fair it's, it's in, in, in music too there's it's a it's a it's in it's in flux now but but this with regards to paintings i mean like i don't know why anybody wouldn't sort of choose to be in this world given the economic model you know if you're if yeah. you're making if you're making art yeah yeah um you know i hate to bring up a sore subject but i happened to see you know there was like surprising amount of negative feedback um when you had posted about this drop and they're like ah you know you're supposed to be anti-capitalist you're rage against the machine but i think these people have no they're completely ignorant of the fact that decentralized finance and the world of nfts really does fly in the face of our current systems you know it's it, it cuts the capitalists out it, it's yeah. like all the capitalists are the guys that have been keeping all the money and, and keeping it away from the artists you know, this is a, this is a version of the system where, you know, we have code that doesn't get paid, uh, handle that yes. job, and then yeah. the yeah. and then the art and then the money goes to the artist, which I, I honestly think makes some people feel uncomfortable, not just from the change, yeah. but also there's a lot of people that worry that you know the wrong artist is going to get paid, or maybe that it's wrong to to involve money too much with the mm -hmm. creative process, and it's expected. You know, it, yeah. it, it was to be expected. It's it's sad to see, but um, I, I think that the sentiment around all this stuff is going to be changing over the next few years as people get used to it. Yeah, definitely. Um, 
yeah, I was curious what you would have to say to people who um, have doubts about what you're doing. Um, yeah, well, I mean, the, 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 I would say that there, there's two things. One is I think there's a bit of a learning curve for people to just sort of even understand what's going on. And it's because it, mm -hmm. it's while while the space has been around for a while, it's only sort of been in front of the nose of public consciousness over the course of the last year, right? Like that's when it's mm -hmm. made the front page of the New York Times. And so I think that there is a is a bit of a learning curve. I also think that there's um, like the the uh, complaints about sort of the environmental impact is one that you is one that you do here. And right. you know, one of the things that we did with this is we're is, is as a mm -hmm. at least a a band aid measure. First of all, I think that it is it is that's over, it's overstated. And I think that like people who drive cars and fly in airplanes. Mm -hmm. And there's an environmental impact to that as well, which cannot be right. discounted. And perhaps we shouldn't ghettoize one particular way of creating art, or right. perhaps we should. But but it's but it's I think it's been that's been grotesquely out of context. Um, but I really just think that there is a bit of a learning curve that we are all on as this new way of of sharing art is something that mm -hmm. is being digested by the world. For me, like I gotta say this, I'm a, I will freely admit that I'm a neophyte to this whole sort of frame framework. What I love mm. is Dungeons and Dragons. What I love is Peter's art. What I love is sharing something that I'm very passionate about in a non-traditional non -traditional way during a time when the world shut down and sort of provided a life raft for different kinds of creativity and expression. If you don't want to have anything to do with it, that's fine. You know, yeah. that's totally fine. And if mm -hmm. you do want to engage, engage with it, there's some pretty spectacular art that I wrote some hot ass jams for. Yes. And the drop is happening right the fuck now it started 20 minutes ago right <laughs> yeah yeah i i i i've done an, a drop with you guys before and this time same as the last i haven't had the heart to watch it and keep up no. watch the numbers as it's happening it makes me too anxious i'm just going to go I'm and sure. I'm chill with you guys no, for go a bit live your then... life yeah hang out <laughs> 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 just talk about the cool stories behind the art and yeah there you go listen there to you cool go. music yeah um <laughs> Um, actually, Justin says Crick sold out already and Pastor is nearly gone. So thanks for the update. <laughs> oh, awesome. awesome. So that's awesome. But maybe Peter doesn't want to know. So let's well, know. I'll find things. out when the, when everything's all <laughs> when the dust is settled and everything's all sold. Somebody tell me what the final number is and I'll be, mm -hmm. I'll be happy with that. <laughs> um, we, okay. Well, I have a couple more questions and then we also have questions from our uh, community, if you don't mind answering them. Um, but I also wanted to ask you both, um, who are your creative influences? Like, who do you admire? Go ahead, Peter. Um, I've got a lot of people who know my work, know a lot of like the popular influences. I think um, one of the biggest ones in terms of my style of painting has got to be this guy, Brahm, uh, which is, you know, it's so funny. One of the great things about working in the creative field is that you get to meet your heroes and they, they tend to be actually much cooler than you'd expect. Yeah. Um, <laughs> shout out to Bram. You're still awesome. Uh, you know, he's <laughs> a guy I've gotten to meet around the scene. And like, um, what was really funny to me about meeting one of my artistic heroes was I discovered that his creative process and his method of painting was completely different uh, than mine, completely incompatible in every way. So even though I ended up, you know, loving his work and, and learning a lot from it and having an influence like my style of painting, you know, it turns out that uh, at the, there was almost nothing to learn from him on a technical level. <laughs> um, but, he, you know, he's still been an amazing um, uh, example to me about, you know, how to be a, a strong independent artist and, um, you know, how to stand by your work as mm -hmm. he's still out there, you know, writing and, and publishing, uh, you know, writing and illustrating his own stories. And uh, that was a dream of mine. And I, I, I feel so lucky to be able to, to do that sort of thing. I mean, awesome. and, and, and I, sounds familiar. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just gonna say Brom sounds really familiar that name B R O M. Yeah. I mean, he's done. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think anybody who's followed a bunch of old fantasy artists probably seen yeah. his stuff. He was a legendary yeah. uh, artist who worked on the Wizards of the Coast for a long time. But, you know, he's been um, he's still making stuff all the time. Him and his wife are both painters and just out there, like making new shit. And I don't know. It's it's um, it, you know, that somebody is really doing it for the right reasons when they just it becomes a lifelong passion. Mm. And it's like. It's a it. It's interesting having uh, a, a living artist as such a strong influence because it's like, you know, he's still writing his own story out there too. 
Yeah. I mean, and, you, and, and, and for me, I mean, now there's, there's sort of the two ends of the spectrum. There's what we're looking at in the pictures and the influences there would be, you know, from Jack Kirby to like the Marvel and DC comics of my youth to, you know, to Tolkien and then Gary Gygax who like helped create the framework that I had my adventures in, you know, uh, mm -hmm. with regards to my, like my life as a, as a musician, there's, there's, there's two lanes there as well. One is like the, the posters that I had on my wall from, you know, from Jimmy Page to Randy Rhodes to like the kind of the shredding guitar players that, uh, that sort of elevated the instrument to something mm -hmm. that's, that's like where musicianship is important and for me, rock stardom less so. But then I was I was always inspired by people beyond rock and roll, not just in the activist world, but, but beyond rock and roll, people who kind of like re outflanked the, whatever genre they were in, whether it's the winner of the 1973 Belmont Stakes race secretariat, who did like, it was a supernatural event, to, to Richard Pryor, the comedian, who sort of reinvented mm. the way that you view comedy. I always look try to look at the guitar in that way. It's like, it's just a piece of wood with six wires and some electronics that there's, yes, there's a tradition to it, but there may also be a future to it. And one might have a hand in writing that future if you really sort of dispel with some of the past and try to find something within that you can bring out. Anyway, that's my, that's my sort of over intellectualization of why I make <laughs> our R2D2 noises on the guitar. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So, um, I'm like torn between like, do I want to read these questions or just quickly recap what's going on with the drop? But it's, it looks like people are just on to, top of to this drop question. already. So I don't even need to tell. Yeah. So I'm just going to answer these questions uh, in the order they're received. Um, I actually have a personal friend who asked the same question. Uh, when is the Rage show at MSG going to be rescheduled? And when Rage, when Rage reunion? <laughs> That's, a, that's, a, that's an entirely different drop. Uh, I think that those yeah. shows are rescheduled, aren't they? I think they're, I think they're up. I think she said, my friend said the MSG show wasn't rescheduled. Wait, you're, you're not, like, you're not booking the venues yourself. Yeah. <laughs> I know. What the hell? I'm not, I, I do not know, but I, I look, I look forward to playing that show whenever it happens. <laughs> it's, it's so funny. Like during this drop, it's just like it, Maker's Place had their whole crew. Tom's got his whole crew. And then I'm in the middle of it with like, just <laughs> naked by myself. I'm like, <laughs> I have no idea what's going on in these threads. Somebody email me if I know what's hit, if they need anything out of it. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. That's funny. <laughs> um, we got a just uh, can someone said, can Tom come to Whale Island and be our dungeon master? His passion for the story is amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, we have we have like an inside joke that we're going to get an island for our community. Um, well, it's not a joke. It's going to happen. So yeah, <laughs> I mean, would love to play NFT money pretty real you get enough uh successful nft traders out there island is not that un not, unreasonable yeah <laughs> right. i, I well, like that is, you put that in our vortex thank you peter yeah if there <laughs> if there is a uh if there is an if there is an island to play dungeons and dragons on i'd be happy to go play dungeons and dragons on oh yeah um there's actually another question i had for you guys um because there are creators in the space that are creating these like vr worlds and um just looking at this awesome art and the music with it um have you thought about uh collaborating in the future and creating um immersive vr spaces that every day could be every day. Every day. inspired every day. <laughs> <laughs> every day i would love to see that like if you could actually have the D D like like do it in VR together and yeah, yeah. be oh, that would be, characters. That would oh be crazy. God. That would be so crazy. I mean, I mean yeah. please do that. <laughs> please do it. Please. Someone someone write the code. Someone write the code. But even so I think a lot about the idea of you, you know, I've had I have this whole world with these, you know, larger than life characters, just being able to you know, Tom, I don't know if you've used VR at all, but like the a little the bit the experience for me is often just like you're actually in the room with the thing to actually yeah. be in the room with your characters would be uh, a totally unique experience that nobody's ever really gotten to have yeah, before. Yeah. So actually working with people and building something like that, um, that that's a dream definitely on the list of like things I want to do as like I work my way through my career. Yeah. And there's, there's one thing we haven't talked about yet, but there's, but there's one element to the drop of actually playing Dungeons and Dragons with me. Is that in the? I want to make, I want to make sure. Is that in the description? Is that not uh, in the description? Uh, so there the description, was so much in the email about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, it says I, 
I remember yes. agreeing to such a thing, and I haven't. We haven't talked about it yet today. Oh, wait. Oh my wait. gosh. Uh, I mean, that oh, would make sense. There's something oh, about it's in the open edition, open, open limited editions. Oh, we didn't. I don't even think we showed the last piece of art, the one with the. Oh group. yeah. No, we didn't. I. We didn't. I wanted to. I Let's wanted to that. say no to this so bad because I've never done a piece like this before, yeah. and I had no idea if it was going to turn out. And this I'm, is the open I'm, edition. It came. It came together. Yeah, it's like it's it sort of great. like this is the this is the Avengers Assemble one of the Order of Keras, and it, and and so then I'm not sure exactly what the what the deal is here for this, but but um, but some some lucky winner winner we will be playing Dungeons and Dragons together while yeah. you're while you're looking at this picture. Yeah, each <laughs> purchase currently... edition enters you in a raffle for a chance to play a game of Dungeons and Dragons with Tom and his friends. What? Yeah, yeah, that's so there's, cool. There's 17 entries in there, so you know, buying one right now is like an amazing possibility yeah. of winning uh, this thing. So we have to end the interview now so that I can go buy it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Nightmare was asking, are there miniatures or physicals in the scope eventually? Um. There are there are not currently, but there perhaps will be. I love the idea of of having miniatures of these. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, I would love to see them as. Oh wait, let's make let's make Peter big. Hold on. Uh, oh I I have I have done some Angel Aaron minis, and I'm in talks to do a whole lot more. Uh, that's I love awesome. Making minis out of my guys. I love you know this is like, I've been working on my own brand for a while, so making all sorts of other random stuff like that. That's like my full time job. So. Uh, oh my gosh. It would be cool to have figurines I, of all these characters. I, re so. I recommend it not from a money standpoint because there's not a lot of money in it, but it is really cool to have minis of your own characters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I always like figurines and toys. Mm. Um, th there is also a question. Um, did either of you play Magic? Magic the Gathering. I, I played yes. from third edition when I was a little kid. Magic kind of, I was, I, it, Magic didn't come around when I was a kid. It sort of, I sort mm -hmm. of missed that, missed that chapter. However, my kids have played Magic. And so I've had to learn how to lose at Magic, which I do mm. all the time. And I, I've beaten them once or twice. We would go to like, they go to tournaments and stuff. I got to tell you, like, there's so much more wow. math and the, there was much, a lot more math in that than there was in my D&D, &D, which uh, is slightly <laughs> off putting. I think the artwork is beautiful though. I mean, the artwork is so beautiful on those, on those cards. And I sort of, gravitated more yeah. towards the artwork than the the rules and the, the yeah the, yeah there was a lot of great art on those cards yeah um, really great art yeah i've been, I never I've been to, to a lot of those tournaments so I, I used to get back when i was actively working for them they would fly me out i would um I, i've flown out all over the world and been to japan and chile and um mm -hmm. all over europe and stuff to go sign cards for people at those tournaments <laughs> so cool uh but i every time i tried to play in my adult life i just got I just got wrecked. I'm so bad at magic. <laughs> yeah, I never. It's did such that. a hard game. No, I I didn't have my own deck. I remember playing with my friends a little bit in middle school, and they like let me make a deck out of the cards that they had. I had a green and black one, and I was terrible, and it wasn't fair. But I liked looking at all the cool angels yeah, and I shit that was on the yeah, card. I was like, I, sweet. I really think there's a huge <laughs> overlap between magic fan base and crypto just because it's the same yeah. brain that you win at magic uh -huh. and do and figure out like fintech. It's the same, it's the same like autism that I think the, you know, <laughs> it assists both of those. Um, so I, I, I'm, I would not, I would love to be able to mint all of my old magic cards and they won't let me. Uh, ah. I, I want to do it not, not so much for the money because, but I know there, there's so many big time magic fans in this space and they would love yeah, they, to collect they these would love things. It. If, if somebody, one of these lawyers could stop digging in their heels and just make it happen. That'd be cool. I mean, it'd be that. so nice to see them on, you know, those, uh, those NFT display frames instead of just yeah. this teeny tiny card. It would be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. Maybe, maybe as the NFT space grows, they'll once they see the money in it, they'll start to change their minds because they can always build it into the smart contract that they get some kind of royalties, even though they didn't create the art. They just the artist. It. <laughs> the artists used to get royalties on the magic cards, um, mm -hmm. and they used to get a small. They used to take a small percentage of the profits and distribute it amongst all the artists based off of the amount of art that you did for the set. Oh. And artists early on were getting these massive six-figure checks because. They, uh, you know, if they, if you've done a lot of art for the game, you were starting to get life-changing amounts of money. 
And wow. then when they got bought out by a billion dollar international toy company, contracts mm -hmm. all got changed. And that stuff all uh, put an end to all that. But, you know, if if um, a project like Magic the Gathering were to enter into the crypto space, the, mm -hmm. you know, we might be looking at a grand reset and uh, people who actually make the game might be starting to get their cred credit and, uh, and their pay again, which would be fantastic to see. Yeah. Um, well, I think that's all of our community questions. Um, so just, I know both of you have a lot going on. So is there any um, upcoming drops, projects, or events that we should know about? Go ahead, Peter. Um, I've, <laughs> I've got a bunch of stuff that I'm working on. I'm doing a, a, I've got a collection of 20 profile pictures that I decided to try to make over the course of the last month. I'm almost done with those. Um, I don't know where those are going to drop. I don't know what format they're going to take um i've been hanging out in the oni discord a lot if you you guys yeah. ever uh, for those of you who are out there collecting pfps and i'm an oni maxi and i've been hanging out in the discord hanging out there working on stuff uh that i'm probably not supposed to show to anybody um over in there just screen sharing first. i didn't i didn't tease any of this i didn't break nda on any of this stuff but um let's just say i've been soft with N ndas out there in in the, some of these private spaces so you know come find me over there if you want to see uh, hang out with some good people. Um, I don't know. Uh, thanks, Tom, for uh, picking me out of the out of the selection of artists on Maker's Place. So it's a real honor to be a part of this thing. Yeah, well, you you did you did great. It's just it's so much like both Dungeons and Dragons and this project. Like I I do because I love it. You know what I mean? It's just it's so much fun to sort of see those characters come to life in the way that you that you've made them come to life. I don't have any other drops other than an album. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Back, 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 mm -hmm. back to my back to my day job. Yes. Uh, on, on October fifteenth, I have a record out called "The Atlas Underground Fire," which has collaborations with Bruce Springsteen and Eddie Vedder and Bring Me the Horizon and Fanagram and Chris Stapleton and Grandson and Mike Posner and yes. Damian Marley and Protohype and Refused and Sama Abdul Hadi. So it's like it's a collab record. A, a lot of big, a lot of yeah, big jams. I heard, that, <laughs> I heard that Highway to Hell um, cover. It's yeah. incredible. Yeah, Just super fun. Ass. Super so fun with, with Bruce Springsteen and Eddie Vedder. Yeah, Did you see that was coming out on yes. October 15th? Yeah. Yes. That's my birthday. Oh, oh I'm the eighth. Happy Yay. Birthday. That's my that's my happy son's birthday, birthday too. Eight, October 15th. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Crazy. Happy, well, happy early birthday to, to oh. all of you. Yeah, yes. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, it has been an honor and pleasure talking with both of you today. Thank you so much for your time and energy and talking with our community and just sharing so openly and honestly. Um, it was really cool hearing about all this and I'm wishing you luck with the drop. I'm sure it's going to be sold out in a couple minutes. So, um, yeah. yeah, thank you again. Well, th and, thanks very uh, much for having us. And thanks thanks again for, to Peter for your excellent work on this. It's just, it's so great. And that, uh, you know, to be able to, like I said, to just to see these ideas, these characters that are very, very meaningful. And like, this is, it is literally like sort of a lifetime of characters that you've made into this kind of Avengers assemble and this, in this kick-ass collection. So I really appreciate it. And if the computer, and if the, and if the, and if the internet wants to collaborate, there's some music that go along with all these, which are very, very, very good. I did, yes. the last, last thing I'll say so was, mad. I, yeah, some about uh, uh, in 2011, uh, I wrote a graphic novel uh, on Dark Horse called Orchid, and I scored each of the issues. And this reminded me of that process of just like sort of taking, you know, sort of a non traditional film scoring way, but sort of taking some a non traditional thing and scoring. So it was a real pleasure to, you know, rock some spooky jams, some kick ass jams with these things. And so that's a part of it that. Hopefully, if you're checking the site, the internet is co is uh, cooperative. Yes, there, so yes, I'm hoping it's cooperating because it was working earlier and I was loving it. So yeah, um, yeah, yeah, and they all it all just works so well together. There was such great chemistry on this project, and um, 